So welcome to what I'm told is episode 21 of Pulling Back the Curtain. Uh, we have Cami Bradley. Hello. Thank you. We for may learn me. even a new name to call you <laughs> in this in this podcast. Thank you so much uh, for being here. So for those of you who might not have caught one of our earlier podcasts, uh, the inspiration, the intrigue is really interviewing people who, whether it's entrepreneurship uh, or chasing some type of an endeavor, really unpacking what got you started in that direction, what keeps you motivated, what keeps you bouncing back from the inevitable setbacks that people all have and unpacking some of those things that hopefully um, there might be something to share that Mm. people can take inspiration and hope from and in their own journeys. So with that, uh, for those people who don't know you, just maybe a quick background bio, who you are, where you grew up, et cetera. I'm Cami. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I grew up in Spokane, mm-hmm. born and raised. Uh, I've honestly been to so many places in the U.S. now and outside of the U.S., and I still love Spokane. Spokane's still the place. It's huh? home. Yeah. I, don't, I really love everything about it, and not in the way that's like, oh, my family's here. They are, but mm-hmm. also just everything about it. So mm-hmm. um, I am a photographer mm-hmm. and a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, those are, I mean, those are considered my jobs Mm -hmm. um but they're also my creative outlets and how i connect with people and um i've been doing music since geez i honestly don't remember so i've got a three-year-old and i I, we're gonna put it to be determined (laughs) even though if i can say that if it's coming from my wife and i her hope for a singing career is probably not great but there's a ton of frozen going on at our house lots of let let it go when did you learn that you could sing, that you, you weren't just uh, singing your favorite Disney songs, that there might be something uh, here that if, whether you wanted to take it professionally or not, at least you were gonna do it in front of people beyond just your family? So if we go way, way back, I've been told when I was all, two years yeah, old, yeah. I was in the car driving with my father, he was singing jazz scales to warm up. Is your father a singer? Yeah. Okay. And so I you started. So you had a little bit more DNA hope than my daughter. Both my had. parents sing, both and a lot <laughs> okay. of my extended family are musicians All right. too. So All right. All yeah. right. I got DNA a little pool. a little Different leg DNA up. Pool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was told that I started singing jazz skills at two years old with him. Don't remember that, but I believe them. Mm-hmm. They're pretty honest people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was probably in junior high when I started to see it for myself that not only did I love it, but that I was gifted at it. And mm-hmm. um, that my dad used to tell me, you know, you can't rely on just your gift, just the talent. And so I started taking that to heart and realizing if if I am gifted at this, then that means I need to start putting work into it. Mm-hmm. And around 13, 14 is when I, I really took that and, and ran with it and started mm-hmm. putting work into my, my craft. Quick side note, if I may. So 13 and 14 is also when I started my singing career. It has also ended the same day it started. <laughs> so what was my it? own uh, humble humbleness aside, I was selected, I don't know if you got this honor or not, Cami, to be in a select group called The Night at my junior high. I have six, six guys out of the whole choir in Clarkson, Washington. Pretty big pool of talent. Um, <laughs> to have a special song done, right? So is my memory, and I've done my best to try to black this out, uh, we're gonna sing some song and we replace it with the Peter Cetera song that starts off like, I'm a man of honor or something to that effect. And like the day before, she's like, hey, try this new song to the group. We sing it, she's like, I think that's better. Let's do that tomorrow in the choral concert, right? <laughs> And it was like a multi-grade, like sixth grade all the way through like 10th grade or 11th grade. And she's like, I really think you guys should take the sheet music out there. We're much too cool for that. So no jokes, we go out, um, sing like the first verse, maybe get through the first chorus, and then collectively we all forget the lyrics, like we freeze. And we proceed to, this is on tape somewhere, (laughs) I hope burned and buried hum for the next two minutes no. yeah yeah just 
Uh, it's uh, and then our choir teacher made us watch the next day at school. <laughs> anyway, last time I sung in public, uh, that wasn't in a car, what, subjecting. Do you to want it, today so. to be the time that you make your comeback? Or? No, I don't feel like it's right. Okay. I, I mean, we could do a duet where I hum and you, because <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> anyway, good for you, because I was I recall that it was pretty intimidating, uh, pretty intimidating thing. So what did that mean for you then? And then how did that? Um, progress in terms of, okay, you're 13, you're 14, you want to take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. Obviously still pretty young, you're in school, so is it mainly school stuff to begin with, or did you start performing outside of so the typical church I, school settings? Yeah, I mean, I performed a ton in the church. I think beyond just performing, it became, I, I became a sponge. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded by a lot of talented musicians that came in and out of the church that I was, mm -hmm. I was singing in and mm -hmm. being a part of. Um, but I didn't just watch. I asked questions. I leaned in. I, um, you know, I would step outside of my comfort zone as far as like, I remember one weekend my dad said, hey, you're singing this weekend. Why don't you jump on the piano as well? And at that time, I think I played like maybe eight chords. Like I didn't know <laughs> anything. I didn't know really what I was doing <laughs> um, and was really uncomfortable with the idea of that. But said yes anyways mm -hmm. and that's I think that's been kind of um, an overall theme for how I make decisions and what I do next and moving forward is I just you know I I say yes I mean this interview is a, a, this, a good this, example this is, because yeah, I don't like this kind of stuff this is your, this is your nervous <laughs> moment if at any point in time you just start humming I'll step yes. in and save you um, <laughs> no so you know obviously in the vice business and, and talk about money but when you're you develop those ties. Um, you find yourselves giving advice on a lot of things, whether it's to clients, friends, students that come in. And, and you touched on something that I think is so key, which is, tell me, if you're too comfortable with the decision or the direction, it's probably the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. That's about the only ge generic rule, because it's obviously so dependent on the variables. But if like it seems too easy, too obvious, yep. there's nothing to risk, you know, it doesn't make you uncomfortable, it probably isn't the right thing. I mm -hmm. mean, if you could give blanket advice like that, so no, that's that's really true. Um, where did it go from there? And photography comes in where? Uh, photography came quite a bit later. Um, okay. I would say music was the forefront for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, I was always interested in something else, graphic design or photography or just, they all kind of tied together in the creative. Artistic, yeah. 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 Um, but never really did much about it. I thought, you know, I probably need to go to school at some point. Um, don't love school. So never really took that step to <laughs> take more classes or go back. Um, and then my husband bought me a camera. I honestly, I think it was maybe seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and he, it was, you know, one of the baseline Nikons mm -hmm. and said, hey, just for fun, here you go. I know you've always wanted to try it. <laughs> Um, so I picked it up and started playing around with it. And within six months, I realized this is something I, I'm really, really into and I really, really love. <laughs> so from that point, it was like you know, basically saying yes before I was ready again, um, taking on weddings and doing things that I probably wouldn't recommend doing <laughs> as a photographer Jeff, now. Like, Jeff, hey, Jeff. maybe don't like take on that big of a commitment. The like the ruin mo mo someone's yes, entire day. day. Did you do that? Did you ruin somebody's? I didn't. You didn't? I have yet to ruin someone's you entire you day. You avoided that? <laughs> More than a few friends who got like green toned pictures oh back from their, their weddings. <laughs> One of them may work in this I office. have lots of friends well, who well, lost maybe. their photos completely. Like who don't just, have any. None? No. Because they hired the wrong person. Yeah, Jake in our office. Uh, there's... I think they got a few good ones here or there, but I think more from like friends' iPhones than actually the person they paid to take their pictures. Oof. But um, how do the how do we can come back to this too? But how do those two things? What was it initially? They're both obviously within the creative realm, but how do they differ for you? Does one are they completely unrelated? Does one give you an escape from the other? Do you grab inspiration from one for the other? A little bit of both. Tell me about the interplay between those two different outlets that you have? I think that the only tie-in for me in both of, of my careers is the relationship aspect. Um, both are 
very very highly predicated on making relationships and um, and personality and you know keeping things moving because you have something authentic. Mm-hmm. Um, so other than that, like they really don't ever mesh <laughs> unless it's I'm singing at a wedding and also photographing it. Do you which find has it, <laughs> are they are they both always on for you, or do you find yourself taking breaks from one to go spend more time with the other? Or? No, they're both always on. I mean, in different ways. I have seasons. Obviously, sure. photography when there's sunshine, it's Ramps busier. Up a bit, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say. I pretty much juggle them the same amount of hours per week. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they help each other because oftentimes, um, you know, I'm shooting a wedding and then I get on an airplane and I fly to Germany and I edit those photos as I fly to Germany. So mm-hmm. it's like they kind of go hand in hand with how the hours work and putting the work into each one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to say that there aren't times where it's like, you know, I'm up to my eyeballs and in work because I don't say no to something. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really do love them both to the same level. So Hmm. it's really hard to... So photography caught up quick then. Yeah, it did. I mean, if if I were to be like 100% honest and I had to choose, I'd probably say music barely beats it. Sure. Um, But depending on the day, photography has its How we get to some maybe work-life personal balance stuff later but in terms of those two businesses you mentioned sometimes you take on too much have they found a good equilibrium did that take a little while to find that do you have you had to put some disciplines or safeguards is probably too dramatic a word but just scheduling around it so that mm-hmm. you do maintain a healthy balance and, and yeah keep good I'm energy. pretty bad at that yeah. I say yes a lot <laughs> okay uh is the, this something you're just owning or are you gonna <laughs> try to work on it or have you tried to, <laughs> I'm owning it I know I have tried to work on I'm it comfortable with that. <laughs> um the past year it kind of caught up to me just because <laughs> I um there were things that I couldn't do with music because I had already made commitment to photography Mm -hmm. and weddings are a huge example of that because someone books me a year out and then I get called on a tour. Um, you know, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Because both I have contractual obligations to, um, what do you do with that? (laughs) Well, this past year I actually set up a system. So I subcontract out. I have a team of photographers that basically take over, what I do mm-hmm. if I have to go mm-hmm. and all of my clients know and are on board before they sign on the dotted line. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've created systems in order to be able to, um, not back out of things. Cause when I commit to something, I really want to make sure that I'm in yeah. fully. You get all of me, even if, you know, I'm not there for the eight hours I'm there in every other way possible. Yeah. Um, so I have had to create systems, especially the last year, um, on how to cover everything and, and make sure that I can still do both and still be um, honest with my clients. And um, But it's a process for sure, because I, I really do like saying yes. I love to, I like to be busy. I mm-hmm. like, you know, going different places. I like being able to make people happy. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's an ongoing journey for me. <laughs> I was going to ask you, and maybe it's probably multiple things because we haven't gotten to the sweeplings yet, but um, these people that you work with, on the, are these employees, coworkers, colleagues? Are they just independent contractors? So and where I'm going with this is yeah. maybe some management leadership questions. but Totally. Um, the people that... Are, would take a wedding for me. So oh, I'll split it up for you. So I have I have two teams, technically. <clears throat> um, I have a list of like assistant second shooters that come with me when I'm present. Mm-hmm. And then I have a list of um, people who run their own businesses already mm-hmm. um, and are just my people if I need like full attention and I don't have to question anything that will go on. Like, Mm -hmm. I already know they've done this for years. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have those two pools of people that I pull from Mm -hmm. for all of these things. And then on the music side, I have the Sweeplings, which were a team of four people, and then uh, my husband as well. So I basically have these like little groupings of people that I rely on and Mm -hmm. and manage Mm -hmm. um, in order to make everything happen for all of the chaos that's going on how 
maybe give me some lessons. So one of the things I found, I'll, I'll start maybe give you an example, is I was a pretty good leader, um, good at vision, good at inspiring, mm. not a great manager, not mm. great at, I'd be like, you know, Cammy, this is what we're going to do. I'm like, great, sounds like a plan. And I'm like, okay, go get it done. And they'd be like, what, <laughs> Wait, what are do the do? 10 steps that, how do I, and I was like, for me, some of it was intuitive that maybe, you know, whether it was experience or just came natural, but I didn't think to put all the lines down. Mm-hmm. That's still a work in progress. I think I'll always be much more naturally a leader, not as great of a manager. Um, it takes a little bit more forethought and work. Have you, I don't know if that concept makes any sense to you or yeah. how have you, what have you learned about yourself as a leader, as a manager, how those two things different that, that again, might have caught you by surprise before you started being in that type of a community? Yeah. Um, So I would say I grew up under really, really good leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, I was on staff at Life Center Church Mm -hmm. for, I can't remember how many years, seven or eight years. Um, And my parents were my bosses, and they were probably the best examples of leadership I could have ever asked for Mm -hmm. um, as far as vision and you know, uh, care and mm-hmm. all of that. Um, then I married my husband mm-hmm. and he, he's an amazing leader as well, but he is definitely a visionary. He thinks big picture and he thinks so beyond the scope. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I was modeled two things before these businesses even really started. I was modeled these two different types of Vision so and that leadership. first one being a little bit different from so, leadership or yeah, more of a management so, component? Yeah, the management part of it. So my parents are really good leaders, but they also they also blend together and make it detailed. very, very detailed. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's lists and this is how you get it done and this is how you care for people and this is why you do it and this is how you do it. Um, and then my husband is more of like, let's shoot for the this moon. Crazy yeah. Idea. <laughs> yeah. And every time he comes to me with something, I'm like, you are insane, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, so I was really lucky because I had learned the skills and tools really early on mm-hmm. to have those like bullet point mm-hmm. ways of doing things. So I'm, I'm a list maker. I like things to be very organized. I want to pass things off to you in a way that's like, this is exactly what you want to do. Um, if you want it to be the way I'm running it, this is mm-hmm. what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the flip side of that, I have this man in my life who dreams big Mm -hmm. and pushes me to do the same. Mm -hmm. So there's many, many times where he's come in into my business or my thought process and Mm -hmm. said, okay, I know this is the way your list says, Mm -hmm. but what if you did this? And that's pushed me now to my own thoughts to say. So if that hearing you correctly, you come from maybe a little bit different position where I'm more of the vision, big, Mm -hmm. it sounds like more like your husband. You I come, come from the other more side, of the I management think. leadership mm-hmm. detail thing. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Oh, that's probably helped you with your group. <laughs> they're both <laughs> they're both so valuable, but it's an interesting dynamic when you know. At least for me, you go from just having to take care of yourself to having to take care of or be a part of or in relationship with so many other people. Sure, um, but for you then. Yeah. What did you do? <clears throat> so did you take that and go? Okay, then I need to hire somebody who will. Mm-hmm. who will be able to organize those things and manage these parts so that I can be the vision? Or yeah. did you have to learn how to do both? I think it's a little bit of both. So when it comes to, you know, 10 Capital in this company, uh, initially you looked, I looked within. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, when this realization started to dawn on me, you're like, okay, I got to fix this ASAP. Um, and so you looked for, obviously, my uh, partner, Jake, um, very detail oriented, uh, likes to take something and, and help go implement it. And so it was looking within because you didn't have a lot of money. I mean, there was no, let's just go hire a bunch of great talent to fill in these yeah. gaps. There's the companies. So there was that coupled with, hey, you just need to learn some stuff and mm-hmm. maybe this isn't as natural or fun um, for you, but it's, it's important. And so, yeah, getting those in as the firm's grown, not that I would say the first two went away. Um, but yeah, we've then brought in more talent, 
uh, whether that's you know kind of outsourcing financial officer type roles, bookkeeping, things like mm-hmm. that, uh, to help understand where things are going on that front, to compliance, I mean, just so many different things. So now it's more of a combination, right. um, which is neat. And I've kept a lot of it outside the firm so that people can come look in with fresh eyes. That was another thing that I didn't mm-hmm. want group think setting in where we just kind of whether we had a great list or not, it was just mm-hmm. our list and there became something sacred about it as opposed to, hey, are we evolving and are we being dynamic? Because I've been part of organizations that just kept doing things the way that always been done. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's uh, a balance for sure because I, I definitely see people who are not good at something and they focus all their time and attention on that thing that they're not good at. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, then your skill that you are good at never right. grows and never gets any better because right. it just kind of lays dormant because you're already good at it. Yeah. So I think it really is, you know, finding the balance between pouring into the thing or or hiring the thing that you're bad at um, and then investing into the thing that you're good at. Yeah. I, and, or conversely, just denying that they're <laughs> you're not great at right. everything. <laughs> no, I think that's it. And I know there's been read plenty of a lot about it because it forever was, whether it was how people felt they should do things or maybe it was the old school coaching of, hey, you need to turn your week weaknesses into strengths, right? right? It was kind of a thing where it seems like the modern logic is, you know, you may want to work on them and make them functional, but Mm -hmm. don't detract from your talents, your gifts. That's where you want to spend the majority of your time. Um, What now is you, photography, obviously that might be more event driven. When it comes to the music, are you right? You write a lot of your own Mm -hmm. stuff? Where do you, where do you find inspiration? Because I've never quite even some of my so for me music taste runs the whole uh certainly i've heard you sing um uh but in in terms of you know just general i've got i don't care whether it's someone like the national who might be more artistic and dark to Mm -hmm. some things that are pop sometimes i read lyrics and i love the song and i'm like i don't think i would ever write that because it does make sense but it doesn't make any sense how do you how do you think through the writing process and um, do you ever have any of those struggles where like this sounds silly, but then you sing it and all the time it's wonderful? Yeah, actually, yeah. that's a huge part of songwriting. The way that it's said or the way that it's sung mm-hmm. can make or break the lyric. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, um, inspiration comes everywhere from everywhere. Um, but personal experience is what makes those things work, which makes good songs work. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think, at least the music that I really love, it's mm-hmm. it's the connection. There's an emotion that you feel. There's a realness or a rawness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, the thing, the things that are on the radio are not always that. They're like, right. you know, really peppy and poppy. And Some of them are just amazing. There was that song about lipstick or lip gloss or something <laughs> like years ago. And I'm like, I just took a little hard. I'm like, this is why you're never meant to be in that I because know. that song person producer made gazillions of dollars <laughs> like it's the dumbest thing i've ever it, heard it's which crazy i think pretty much synopsis in my i'm getting to be that old guy now but like how i feel about most pop music these but days. i was just watching um songland have you heard of that show hmm, I, so it's it's i've got it's a three-year-old so like i've kind of checked out on the whole <laughs> pop culture thing like three years ago no it's this new <clears> show <throat> and it's all about songwriting i mean <laughs> It's all about songwriting, you know. Sure. Uh, But there was this song that came on. We just watched it last night, and the lyrics were so cheesy. It Mm. was like, uh, what was it? Be nice. Be nice. Be something. And it was like the cheesiest thing you could have ever heard. And they, like, show a sheet of the music on the table, and you read the lyrics, and you're like, okay. And he started singing it, and I was like, well... That works. Dang it. <laughs> they made that work. And That's I crazy. could never write that. Yeah. Because I would I would literally write People the lyrics out or even me. sing yeah. and I, they would yeah. My yeah. husband would be the first one to raise his hand and say, No, you're not showing that to anyone Tell ever. Tell me about that, because I was gonna <laughs> ask you about that. Like maybe maybe an example of each and, and not specific story, but even more than that, how it made you feel? A time where you wrote something, sang something, combination thereof and you thought this is just not good and then other people stepped in and you were wrong it was good people loved it it was great and conversely something where maybe 
you did something like this is my work of art <laughs> <laughs> and you did it and whether it's your husband or someone else like that's no. awful um okay, has it so ever the, happened to you or the is it first all? one yeah. happens every time i write a song okay. really truly i'm i am a little bit well i am a, a pessimist mm -hmm. when it comes to my own music every mm -hmm. time i write something I'm like eh, probably not good enough mm -hmm. so i really use the people that i trust mm -hmm. to help me temper my own thoughts and feelings on my music because you my, the first thing i usually think is it's probably is not good enough yeah. yeah um but that's kind of part of the music process anyways is you just have to sit down and lay it all out there and only go, kanye west i think it doesn't actually really matter thinks everything that he oh does my is, gosh is the greatest thing Good old kanye. it sounds like most artists <laughs> struggle with sometimes and he's just like I'm killing it i'm still yeah. killing it <laughs> but on the other side of it so um i'm in a duo with a guy from alabama called the sweeplings and um his wife is she, we have a, probably a million stories like this, but yeah. we were writing this song. We were both pretty excited about it because it was a little bit different than something we had written before. We, we write a lot of sad songs, yeah. and it was a little bit happier. Um, and so we, we got done with it. We showed her it, and both of us were, like, smiling, like, how so proud, proud. Of, yeah, <laughs> how proud are you of us? Because we just wrote a happy song, and it's actually good. Like, it's not cheesy at all. And she sat back in her chair, and she goes, well, it's not going to win a Grammy. And we were like, what? Like, but would it sell a million records? <laughs> right. Does it have to win a Grammy? But we, we ended up rewriting the <laughs> chorus of it, and it was, it was way better than she we... She was right. Yeah, she was right. So you have, to, you have to surround yourself with people that you trust to be able to speak both, I think, into your, into your music, into your, yeah. into your life. Otherwise, you're just going to be... Do you take that criticism well? So, since you're already coming from... Um, to use your word, a more pessimistic place, mm -hmm. a little bit of doubt. How do you respond then when someone, you know, I wouldn't say feeds into that, but like says, you're right, Cammie, that isn't good. How do you, how do you not let that be defeating? It's pretty rare that it defeats me mostly mm. because I, it's, it's, um, the patterns that I've set with the people that get to say those things into my music, um, they, I mean, for the most part, they're very encouraging and helpful in the process. So mm -hmm. even if it's criticism, it's, hey, nice, this is yeah. this is a stepping stone to get you to something better. And I don't remember a time that it hasn't gotten me to something better. Mm -hmm. um, it's very so rare. So you've that never had have... a situation starting up where you no, say you're like, you're wrong. This is awesome, and I'm not changing it. Uh, yes, there's been a couple of those. A couple of those too. But I'm not always right. Fifty-fifty <laughs> <laughs> on those. <laughs> No, but you're right. There, there are moments where I kind of stick up for what I think should be there. Um, mm -hmm. And especially with my husband, we will kind of go back and forth on it for a while. And one of us will eventually concede to the other like, oh, you know, you're right. I was missing that. Or he'll stick up for himself again and say, I think this needs to change. I've all, I, I'm, this is a work in process and thought. Um, let me know if this doesn't make sense. I've always felt like in some similar ways because I think again unless someone's <clears throat> perhaps just pathological and never doubts or questions themselves I'm not sure what that would lead to <laughs> um, there's almost these three different layers though where to your point there is that safety that ultimately that sense of success or arrival where we can get there with your team mm -hmm. there's this thing that I don't know defines true self of that can be of more of that doubt and that pessimism but I think I almost think it isn't the that's that part of ourselves that we use to connect with other people or is only vulnerable because of those other people but underneath that is that bedrock of self-confidence that mm -hmm. you have to have mm -hmm. whatever doubt you have you still keep singing right. I still keep trying to do new things in the business world or within the community um, again kind of like that leadership management thing but obviously in a different way of just understanding some of those nuances of like because I'd start to find myself on the one hand feeling vulnerable feeling hurt feeling whatever it may be questioning doubtful but then just this well of strength underneath it like if things if i got backed up eventually to this wall then i could almost feel myself push back off that wall of confidence and strength of like you know whether this thing is or isn't good right now i can get it there do right? you think that it's push back into that other group confidence or because i don't know if i fall back to confidence yeah but there is something there so i don't know if it's like 
passion. Like I love it so much that I don't really care. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's or, it's, it's in process thought, yeah. Cammy, so we can flesh this out. But <laughs> no, there's some. But there was some. There is something. I'd find myself surprised because even in some of those moments of doubt, of weakness, of hurt, and vulnerability, I mean, it can manifest in so many different ways. All of a sudden, I learn to even when I couldn't feel it underneath my feet or behind my back mm-hmm. or whatever it was, trust that I'm gonna hit that <laughs> or it's there. Right. Um, you use it, like lean into that, uh, trust in that. Um, that again, I think, I think you gotta get beat down to that place a few times and learn that you can come back from whatever that is, mm-hmm. that passion, that confidence, the purpose, yeah. right? A lot of those things that, uh, that drive you. I, I watched, um, Actually, I just watched the documentary that I'd heard the story about of Buster Douglas that had fought Mike Tyson and knocked mm-hmm. him out for mm-hmm. the first time. And it was this concept of why, but his mom uh, would introduce him as the future heavyweight champion of the world. And he was kind of, I didn't realize, I mean, I knew he was kind of a scrub, but I didn't realize what, he was really talented, but he'd never really applied himself. Anyway, Mike Tyson, of course, scariest, baddest man on the planet. Nobody thought he could... And they were talking to him afterwards, and he got knocked down early in the fight. Um, and somewhat to this concept was just like I wasn't for him. It was I wasn't going to let my mom be a liar. Mm-hmm. And she had passed away the, like a week or two before the fight. Oh. And so he had all this emotion and strength. But again, to your point, I think it's probably closer to the truth. That passion, that purpose, that cause. I know Simon Sinek uh, made the word "why" uh, pretty popular. Your why. Uh, that you've got to have there to help get through those mm-hmm. those things. Um, what do you do to stay healthy and energetic? You got so much stuff going on. Uh, I was actually listening to a talk earlier today about just the negative stress in society yeah. and how we're all uh, walking around with way too much stress these days or burnt out. What do you do to to you know maybe recharge on a whether it's a vacations or stuff, but even on a daily basis, what do you do to to stay healthy and able to do everything that you're yeah. doing, especially with travel. That's mm-hmm. got to be draining in its own right. I try really hard um, to have my routine be similar no matter where I am. I mm-hmm. don't always succeed at it, but, uh, you know, doing my quiet time, eating right, exercising. Um, and those are actually pretty new in in my world, at least the <laughs> exercise and eating right are within the last few years. Um, it doesn't have to it, be a big deal when you're 17 and then, exactly. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get stressed, you get worked, yeah. you get older. And, I started to notice yeah. some changes a few years ago yeah. just in my mind of yeah. like, I can't, you know, keep doing, making these choices and, yeah. and waiting for different results. So right. um, made that change and I've, I've noticed it be huge for my, just my energy level mm-hmm. and, um, and the routine of each day. Um, Tell me a little about your routine. What are you doing? Well, I just started with a trainer. Okay. Now I've worked out with one for a few years. People are always like, well, you're a college athlete. And I'm like, I need somebody who's going to make me have to get out of the bed. See, and, and I, w- I never and did that. And, I, yeah. I was not athletic growing yeah. up. I was the drama girl, um, do theater and yeah. singing at church. And so I played soccer until I was like 12, was pretty average at it. <laughs> um, and I don't like doing things that I'm average at. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I started working out a couple years ago and realized I'm not good at this. Like there's a lot of skill that goes into doing things properly and making mm-hmm. sure your body is doing things right and there's habits. And um, so I started with a trainer <laughs> this last winter and my goodness, he's kicking my butt. Mm-hmm. So that's been a new thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and eating clean, mm-hmm. which is an off and on process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, but when I do, it's a game changer for me, yeah. um, especially, especially in just my, um, my mental stability, not stability, like I'm, you know, sinking into the ground, but just, I can see a change in me and it's yeah. food is like a huge part of that. I, uh, forever, I was, I was the super skinny kid. My grandfather used to make all sorts of non-PC jokes about how skinny I was um, back in the day. So I would just, yeah, eat, lift, do whatever I could to put on a little bit of weight to play football. Um, the putting on the weight thing isn't as big of an issue when you're 42. But for me it was 
you know, so the cardio is there for part of it, but I wasn't a cardio guy. That's kind of my point. Like I never right. had to develop that skill set. I was a quarterback mm-hmm. too. So mm-hmm. it was like three drops, maybe a little sprint. I wasn't going off for a distance run. And yet, yeah, those, whether it's stress related, again, as I start to kind of understand now more that, uh, uh, fight or flight mechanisms mm-hmm. and cortisol in our system and what role, you know, cardio can do and really uh, strenuous workouts. It does. It becomes critical to, yep. I made 18 months ago, a super diligent, I had started doing some running, but, um, we can always work Peloton into a podcast. I think oh. the streak's intact, 21 and counting. Um, <laughs> but no, just something that really makes me sweat in a day. I've just found for me, I mean, it does take me back a notch and when you're talking about being a husband and a dad and not wanting to know or colleague employer like not be exploding at people and have that balance it was critical to mm-hmm. like get that cathartic sweat out every day so that I can bring it back so um yeah eating's a different thing I don't for me to trying to understand now around inflammation and foods that create more inflammation I think is huge again yep. another thing I'd hear my parents say mm-hmm. they're like I don't feel swollen today I'm like I have no what clue what you're talking mean? about yeah. now like I'm going to eat popcorn I'm like do I want my fingers to hurt tomorrow <laughs> when I do this or I haven't no? gotten there yet like you think it's coming I'm, Cammie it's I'm coming it's coming it. you're a little younger than I am <laughs> it's coming where you're like okay yeah no but sugars and just those processed foods and all that stuff it does mm. It does play, whether it's your age or the stress or work, um, certainly plays a big role. So there's this guy who's been lurking in your stories, uh, your husband. Yep. How do you, you're traveling, you're doing all this stuff. He's obviously working at the church. How, you got family, like you said, in town. Um, how do you how do you think through that balance? Are there some safeguards you've put up? Obviously, people will talk about phones, but for you, mm-hmm. it's much bigger than that. Sometimes you're not even in the same living room right. or home. How do you how do you stay connected with the people who are important in your life? Well, that is one area that I've gotten pretty good at saying no mm-hmm. um, in, and just out of necessity uh, because I can't be everything for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try really hard when I have periods of time that I'm home that the first priority goes to, you know, a night with my family, a night with his family, and the people that I that invest into me and that I invest into. Um, and that being a key point is that it goes both ways. Because mm-hmm. I have tons and tons of relationships and people that I love, um, but not all of them go both ways. They mm-hmm. go one way or the other. And mm-hmm. so... Um, I really try hard to make those relationships priority first when I'm home and then everything else comes second. And obviously, you know, there's commitment. So sometimes it's like, well, I've got a wedding this weekend. So what does that mean for seeing my family since I'm only going to be home for five days? Um, but we there I mean they're wonderful because we get creative like mm-hmm. we do game nights or we do walks or we do mm-hmm. I go for runs with my sister at midnight like there's just ways that you make it happen um and then saying no to the things that I know can wait or mm-hmm. aren't going to be an investment on on both ends um so I don't know it's it's it, it's ever changing because mm-hmm. my travel schedule and my my careers have not been like the same for any amount of time. Um, but my husband gets to come with me a lot, so we've gotten really good at like making plans around each other's plans and having him come when he can, and really great at FaceTime. <laughs> yeah. And long conversations um, over the phone just so we can stay connected and stay yeah. caught up. Interesting. Um, how are we doing on time? That was a 55 mark. I'm going to still fight an extra five minutes if I can. This is, I always enjoy these. Um, go back real quick. I want to go back to the sweeplings uh, if I can. I also wanted to go back so I don't forget on the interplay between your faith and your career. Um, so as a guy who grew up in a Christian household, and always had, we had always had Christian radio on. I remember when Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith went secular, right? Yeah. Or at least they were. Amy Grant was my first concert. Right? Uh, Leon Patello. Do you remember that name? No. He's a Christian artist at the IMB. How much older it, uh, are you than me? <laughs> 42. I'm 42. How old are you? 31. Okay. So that's a gap. <laughs> my wife's. 
30, I should know, 33 this next, and it is, especially where I'm at, like right on that ver that XY line yeah. of like no cell phones. It's, I mean, I might right. as well be your grandfather. It's like a totally <laughs> different, different universe. <laughs> how people were raised, how it was digital, you know, things that were, you know, yeah, different, different world. Anyway, um, how do you think, I know for some people that's, an issue. I don't know. I would just be curious how it plays out in your career. And if Amy yeah. Grant was your first concert, someone you like to look looked up to, it's a sticky thing for people to put into yep. where they want to be able to be creative and emote, and their faith is certainly part of them. And it may be some underpinning, mm -hmm. even to a lyric that doesn't look at it on its face. But I know that's something that uh, is tricky for some people. How have you thought through that? Is that an issue? Do you just not care? Yeah. No, and, it's very thought through. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, I just wish you'd make a Christian album. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I volunteer at my church and write music for them and and we record things. So technically I have, mm -hmm. um, but I have very purposely not created Christian music mm -hmm. on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I really feel like that world is pretty inundated with artists that are similar to me mm -hmm. um and i just i have a heart not to be in it <laughs> um i think that no to matter stand out or? no i i just don't feel like my passion and my songwriting and my skill set leans towards christian music mm -hmm. um i write a lot of like dark and sad stuff mm. um and i think that god is in that even i mean Honestly, God's more in that part of my life than the happy stuff a lot of times mm -hmm. um, because that's when I need it, you know? That's when I need him, wrong or right. That's mm -hmm. when a lot of us cry out or mm -hmm. pray or mm -hmm. um, see him for who he is. And um, so I I don't know. I've gotten, I've gotten that question a lot. Like, well, how does your faith play into it if you're making pop music? or if you're in the secular world mm -hmm. and the simplest answer is just that he is a part of me so it's going to be a part of everything right. that i do right um and i don't need you to check off i don't need to check all the boxes of christianity or christian music in order right. to to know that you know god is in directing my life yeah. and in the music I mean, and it really yeah. is like right. Right. It, there are things littered through my songwriting that point to my faith. Yeah. But it's not obvious. It, it's it's probably different because literally people will draw lines and the the art that's coming out is different. Um, I guess you could say that maybe the same for lawn mowing services or financial services. But mm -hmm. um, so I think this is probably more applicable in many respects to it always in my in the business world it makes me nervous when people want to lead with that yeah right i always think of the people up the changing tables in the temple yep it's like just be about it like you don't need yeah. to sell it right um you don't need to try to monetize it just whoever you are whatever it is that drives you whether it's a faith perspective um just own it it'll mm -hmm. come out if mm -hmm. it's authentic it'll come out well um, and i think it comes out mostly in my relationships and how I I make business decisions, mm -hmm. how I'm honorable, how I'm loyal. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I see my faith playing into it even more than the music. Mm -hmm. And those are the things I want to stand for and represent anyways, mm -hmm. um, is that who I am as a person and how I, how I do business right. represents, you know, my faith mm -hmm. um, more than I put God into a lyric, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Do you purposely avoid putting God into lyrics? I do. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Sweeplings. Um, and then I guess we'll have to, I do have one last question I wanted to get to, but uh, Sweeplings. How do you do that being, an, it reminds me of the band Postal Service. Do yeah. you remember that band? Yep. They would mail, I think they were literally mailing like eight track cassettes back and forth back yep. then. I um, love that band. But how do, you, how do you guys do it from a distance? How does that... How does that work in terms of music creation, lyrics? Yeah. Obviously, there's some things since the Postal <coughs> Service came out 20 years ago that probably make that a bit easier. Sure. But um, well, still we've, we've tried the Skype writing; it doesn't work super well. <laughs> so you went back to the Postal <laughs> Service. <laughs> they were onto something. No, we um, 
we're really, really efficient with our time. So we get together every few months mm -hmm. and we'll spend basically a week writing. Mm -hmm. And typically we've written half or a whole album in that time period. Oh. Um, so we know like we've got these five days, how are we going to use them? You know, we just put our heads down and go for it. Mm -hmm. And and we found that because of the pressure of only being able to see each other for that amount of time, mm -hmm. we're able to like stay in the creative space instead of, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, it doesn't make things easy by any means, especially because he lives he lives in Huntsville, Alabama. I live in Spokane. Both are like in the top ten most expensive small airports to fly in and out of. Um, so it's. It's a chore every time we have to get together and figure out how to make it work, but <laughs> we do. And somehow, because of that, it's it's made us better as musicians and better songwriters because we have this like very limited box that we have to stay within and or time constriction that we yeah. have to stay within. And if you're not feeling creative, you just get over it and become Basically. creative. Really, truly. Because that would be, I mean, there's days you go to work out or go mm -hmm. do a lot of things, like, I don't have it today. We don't have a choice. Yeah. It's like, too bad. It's, you're sick, too bad. You're getting, Write you're, a song you're that's gonna, low. You're gonna <laughs> make a song about overcoming illness. <laughs> yeah. um, we didn't get so much. I know, obviously, you had the um, Tenure on America's Got Talent. Spokane was rooting for it. We didn't get into that. I'm sure I that, thought we were going to be able to skip over that. Go, we can't. We are. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We are effectively, we're getting the, the buzzer. So uh, there you go. That's how you can do an hour and not even not even talk about that. Um, last question, um, second to last question. So this wasn't too painful. You said I, I'm last cheating. question. It's, I'm going to get the mic. I get no, to do all the two questions. There's it two wasn't questions. too painful. It's like two, three. No, so you might come back. <sighs> I'll think about it. Okay, all right, all right. I'll just renew my vows and trick her and <laughs> have her show up. Oh, sorry, here's a mic. Um, what's success for you? Like what, I know it's a thing to talk uh, about ends and means, but like here you are, like do you want to win a Grammy? Do you? Yeah, heck yeah. Heck yeah, do you want to sell a million albums? Would one be more important? Like is the photography just where you want it to be? Like are there goals out there? Sure. Um, for photography, I, I'm in success. I don't do any promotion and I have the best clients in the world and I get to work as much as I want to and say no to the things I that's, don't want to do. That's a big claim because you're working with brides and I've been, yeah. I've, that's, that's an yeah. emotional I, I seriously love everything about <laughs> my photography business. Um, so I wouldn't say there is an, a next level for me, at least nothing mm -hmm. that I need to attain. Um, for music, it's it's a goal that's always moving. Um, obviously, the big ones would I would love to win a Grammy. I'd love to you know be known. Mm -hmm. um, but that is that's also filtered with a lot of fear for me because mm -hmm. I've never wanted success like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like being in the spotlight. I don't even really like performing. Um, I've grown to love it because I love the process of start to finish mm -hmm. um, with song and then being able to share it um, right. with people who want to listen to it. Um, but I, I don't know if I have like, I don't know if I have like this big um, aspiration to be, well, I know I don't want to be famous, mm -hmm. um, but I know that the things that I do want mean I could be. Um, so they're all kind of tied together and that's why my goals are, are always a little bit shifting like okay well I know I want to win a Grammy which means you have to be n notable enough to be noticed <laughs> and people care about your music so you have mm -hmm. to you know write something that means that's impactful and that means something um, but I think for me the the goal that I always kind of keep in front of me is that I want to be proud of what I'm doing and I want to be authentic with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And um, as I've done that, the people have come along to kind of move my goal forward. So it's it's like if I set this this little goal in front of myself, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. um, and I build the relationships and I have the authenticity that people want to see and want to feel, um, then there's like these little pushes that, that keep kind of happening mm -hmm. um, from all around. Um, and including within myself. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like the goal every day is a little bit different. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. No more questions. Okay. 
You're free. <laughs> People can find your solo work. Um, they can follow you at I am Carmen Jane. Yep. Your, that is your real name. That is my legal didn't name. Even get into that. Your I legal know. name. So Cami, short for Carmen. I've always gone by Cami. Cami. But yes. Um, the band at the Sweeplings, mm-hmm. and the photography at Cami Bradley Photography. You got it. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah.